This mythical mountain has witnessed some of the best cycling battles of all time. Alpe d'Huez has 21 hairpin bends, 13.8 kilometers long, with an average gradient of 8.1%. There's a few different ways to the top of the Alpe d'Huez, but there's only one that really matters to the professionals, and that's the traditional way with all of the history. This year going up it twice will affect the race somewhat, but still obviously going to affect the best times in the race. I think the likes of Froome, Contador, or maybe something like Joaquin Rodriguez of Katusha. The Tour de France first used Alp d'Huez back in 1952, where it was the Italian legend Fausto Coppi who won the stage. It's been used a further 24 times since then, and the names of each of the stage winners have been placed on a placard, which goes up on the hairpin bend sequentially. So on this first hairpin bend, we have the names of Coppi and also Lance Armstrong. Interestingly, on 18 of those occasions, the rider wearing the yellow jersey at the end of the Alpe d'Huez stage has gone on to take the Tour de France overall. This climb can be broken down into four sections, really. It's the first of those sections that's the hardest. It gets up to 10% straight away, that doesn't relent for a further two kilometres, or around 1.2 miles. It's for this reason, it's important not to get too excited as you hit the foot of the climb. There's still a long way to go. I'm coming up to turn 20 here. I've got a few more hairpins. All that gradient just starts slacking off a little bit. The latest winner up Alpe d'Huez was the Frenchman Pierre Roland, and he features on corner 16. And it's here where you get over your initial shock at that steep gradient, and you get some very brief respite. And the church here, the Saint Pierre Church in La Garde en Oison, also has a small tap where you can fill up your bottles. This is a great place as well to perhaps take on some more food. Memorable moments on this climb, whether you like it or not. Back in 2001, where Lance Armstrong, having feigned weakness for the early part of the stage, gave Jan Ulrich a look before riding off into the distance. There's some debate over what the record time is up out Duez, partly due to arguments over exactly where the start and finish line are, and partly due to question marks over the legitimacy of the performance. But back in 1994, Marco Pantani came up here in a time of around about 37 and a half minutes, doing an average speed of an astonishing 23 and a half k's per hour, which is almost double what I'm doing now. From my point of view, one of the key things to remember on a long climb like this is that you really need to pace yourself. You also want to choose the right equipment and have gears where you can stay seated and still turn the pedals. I tend to get out of the saddle a lot, but even I couldn't maintain that all the way up to the top, especially if you've had to ride the extra 100 miles that you might have had to do beforehand for the attack of the Marmot. Between turns 13 and turn 7, gradient gets steeper again, but you'll just have to dig deep and concentrate just like the pros. Back in 2008, my ex-teammate Carlos Sastre attacked at the foot of this climb whilst many of his rivals were watching his teammate Frank Schleck. He soloed to victory on the stage and took enough time to go into the yellow jersey, which he kept all the way to Paris. Interestingly, Chris Froome was the only rider to go with Carlos Sastre initially when he made his attack. He was riding for Barlow World back then, and this year he'll go into this stage as one of the favourites. 
As you approach turn seven, take a look to your right hand side and you'll get a wonderful view down the hill to the valley floor below. As you go round the corner, you'll get your first glimpse of the finish line. There's still a few hundred metres of vertical ascent to do before you get there, but you know that you can do it now. On race day from this point onwards, you can expect to start seeing a lot of people wearing orange because this is where the Dutch fans congregate to cheer on the next Tunisa or Rooks. This climb became a mecca for cycling fans from the Netherlands because for eight of the first 14 times that the Tour passed up here, the stage was won by a Dutchman. Oh, and there's a public toilet just around the corner here, just in case you feel the need to increase your power to weight. The last few corners of this climb are on open terrain, so you'll constantly have the summit in your sights. Watch out though for the last turn, corner one, because straight afterwards there's a 50 metre section which is astonishingly steep. When the Tour de France reaches the finish line here in July, the overall eventual winner will probably be almost decided. But when you come a ride up here, the only decision you're going to have to make when you reach the top is which person you're going to tell first that you've conquered Alpe d'Huez. The only time I ever raced up this climb was a few years ago at the Caterium de Dauphiné. But I highly recommend challenging yourself to come up here at least once in your life so you can see exactly why people who win this stage in the Tour de France go down in the history books of cycling. Fastest time up this side of the mountain is an astonishing 55 minutes and 51 seconds. That was set by Spain's Iban Mayo back in 2004.